Imagine your whole life resting upon the translation of a single word. I once met an asylum seeker who had been rejected for refugee status. He had been forced to leave his home at an hour's notice. His family had received death threats and he suffered from panic attacks and nightmares at the thought of return. So why was he rejected? Well, because he said he traveled to the Turkish border by use of taxi and later used the word private car. The asylum office interpreted this as an incredibility and an inconsistency that undermines his claim. This apparent inconsistency cost him his shot at refugee status. In legal terms, refugee status means that you deserve specific protection from your host state. In other words, the country you fled to. But in real terms, refugee status means you've been taken out from the grueling legal limbo that so many are forced to live through. It means you know which country you'll be living in in a year's time and that the state has an obligation to protect you. That may seem inconsequential to you, but imagine how difficult your life would be without knowing which country you'll be living in in a year's time. Imagine not knowing even how to plan a couple of months ahead because you don't know whether you'll be sent back to a country where you face persecution and fear. Imagine being torn from your studies with no idea of when you'll be able to resume them. Imagine the effect that instability would have upon you. But getting refugee status is no simple matter. Asylum procedures are stringent and they demand a high level of precision and consistency. And that's exactly why I believe that the European refugee crisis is a legal crisis, meaning the solution to it is legal aid. Three years ago, I went to Chios, a Greek island off the coast of Turkey, and I was volunteering there. And one of my duties there was as an English teacher. My best student by far was an individual called Ali Reza. He was always engaged in class, always did his homework, always had questions from the English language videos he would watch the night before. So when he wasn't there one day, obviously, when I next saw him, I asked him what was up, and he said he'd had his asylum interview. Of course, I asked how it went. It was okay, he said, but they gave me a Kurdish interpreter. Here's the thing. Afghans don't speak Kurdish. They speak Dari or Pashto, but most certainly not Kurdish. It turned out that the Dari interpreters won strike that week. So the asylum officers told him he could either try and push ahead with a Kurdish interpreter that knew some limited Dari, or have his asylum interview postponed by a few months. But let me tell you, a few months is an incredibly long time when it's minus two degrees and you're living in a tent. So when he told me that he had a Kurdish interpreter, I panicked. But alarmingly, he didn't. He was telling me about how he didn't understand the interpreter and the interpreter didn't understand him. But he didn't seem that concerned. I insisted he saw a lawyer and what he said that day will always stick in my mind. No, it's okay. I'm from Afghanistan and I'm from an ethnic minority. I told them this when I arrived. These people are professionals. They've seen thousands of cases like mine. And in any case, there's no point in being pushy. I wouldn't live in a flooded tent if I had a choice. They must know that. I think that's a logical point of view. But it's safe to say that sometimes the law is at odds with logic. In the asylum procedure, the burden of proof is upon you to prove that you have a well-founded fear of persecution. That means your story has to be consistent and full of details. It's a pretty twisted irony of fate that a population so plagued by trauma is expected to produce a story that doesn't have a single gap in it. Now imagine you've gone through something traumatic, and it must have been traumatic, because you left your home, your family, your friends, your life, your studies, your everything for it. You're in the asylum interview, and the asylum officer is asking you a series of questions about the journey you had. Could have been six months ago, but you know what, maybe even up to a couple of years. Can you remember how long you spent on the bus? You said that you passed the border between Iran and Turkey. What were the names of all of those villages you passed? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. You said that the Turkish police officers beat you up. Uh, how many exactly of them were there? And let's get back to Afghanistan for a second. When you were being tortured, what was the colour of the ceiling? 
These are all real questions from the asylum interview. So having a Kurdish interpreter was yet another obstacle for Ali Reza in getting refugee status. He was incredibly reluctant to see a lawyer, partly because he couldn't quite fathom how important all the detail was. But when we called back his transcript and he began to see all the mistakes, he saw the situation as we now can. Even basic things were wrong. It said he travelled from Turkey to Iran when it was the other way around. His three-month stay in Turkey was suddenly elongated to three years, making his narrative illogical. Given, as we saw in our opening story, that the difference between taxi and private car can result in a rejection, this was pretty dire. But luckily, the lawyer managed to correct the script, filed a country conditions report, added evidence to his case, and you know what? He received refugee status. So luckily, we were able to help him in time. But for another individual, it was too late. Hussein was also from Afghanistan and thought it obvious that his life would be untenable in his home country. He had a bad stutter and struggled to express himself in more than one sentence answers. On top of that, he had suffered a traumatic brain injury a couple of years ago that meant he had large gaps in his memory. Being from an ethnic minority, many of his family members had been killed by the Taliban when going to seek out work. When he did eventually find work in a secluded area, also to save his family from abject poverty, he became locked into debt bondage, working long hours for little pay. Hussein had a well-founded fear of persecution and he should have received refugee status in the first instance. But traumatized by what he had seen and unable to express himself properly, he said he had left Afghanistan because he couldn't find work. He didn't mention that his father had been executed. Hussein was not a social guy, and he didn't have many friends who were volunteers. But legal aid should not depend on personal connections. It's not a crime to be an introvert, and that shouldn't cost you your shot at refugee status. But sadly, that's what happened to Hussein. When I met Hussein, he had already been rejected once and was appealing. He had given information to his lawyer in the form of a memo for her to submit. But the state lawyers on the Greek islands are typically so overworked that they can only ever meet with a client once. Hussein had been so shocked he'd been rejected that he wasn't able to voice what had happened to him. He missed out many key points in the story. And the fact that he had a starter, well, that got lost in translation. So when I met him, it was already far too late. The psychiatrist was tied up for months and wouldn't be able to produce a report in time. The lawyer had already submitted the appeal memo. When he was told that he had been rejected again, he was told he could appeal for a second time, but he'd need 600 euros. He tried to get the money together, but couldn't. He was deported to Afghanistan before he even got a chance to realize what had happened. What is so tragic about this is it all could have been preventable. If he had met with a lawyer in the first instance, they would have immediately picked up on the memory loss and the stutter and gone in the psychiatrist to write a report that would explain why he wouldn't be able to express himself properly in the interview. The lawyer would have taken the time to listen to his story and write a narrative that would tick that box of the well-founded fear of persecution that is so key for an asylum claim. But that's not what the situation is like at the moment. Perhaps without knowing it, asylum seekers are, across Europe, engaging in a lottery. And refugee status, which is often the difference between life and death, should not depend on luck. And yet, legal aid remains so underfunded. Perhaps one of the reasons why is because it's much harder to market legal aid in comparison to other forms of refugee aid. Legal aid is often very intangible. If you're raising money for food and shelter, you can put that on a poster without the need for explanation. And if a donor gives you money for 10,000 pairs of socks, you can hand those out and say that people were most definitely warmer. It's important to realize, however, that although these forms of aid are vital, they remain short-term solutions. Legal aid in comparison, well, it can often take years to reap the benefits. And that's something really hard to explain on a social media post with a 280 character count. But it's clear that there's a need for legal aid. Across Europe, 
50% of first instance decisions are overturned upon appeal. What does that mean? That means that of the people who are rejected and go on to appeal, 50% of those people are accepted. So clearly presenting your case by yourself is not all that simple. And that's exactly why I set up Solidarity, which is an entirely student-led charity that fundraises for legal aid for refugees and raises awareness about the refugee crisis. Having said that though, sometimes it feels like we're fighting an uphill battle. The society we live in sadly means that what's marketable is what gets the most attention. But nonetheless, we've got a vision that feels realistic. Imagine if every asylum seeker was informed of the procedure and the key terminology before their interview. The people who had a legitimate claim to asylum would be accepted and the camps would begin to free up and the amount of asylum seekers sleeping rough would suddenly have accommodation. The rate of appeals would fall, meaning that so would waiting times. Perhaps we would even begin to address the fact that an entire generation are growing up witnessing or even experiencing sex trafficking, violence, drug trading and possibly even suicide in overcrowded Greek camps. Legal aid is certainly not sexy, and it doesn't come with great photos of refugees holding cups of tea. But it's the most sustainable solution we've got. Thank you.